Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, and today I'm talking to Art Helen. Now, Art's from Central Wisconsin. He's a good friend. Art's been on the show a, a few times, and I've been him a few times at ATA. And Art, it's always great to just catch up and find out what's going on with Own the Season TV and Art Helen Outdoors, plus your photography business. So, Art, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bruce. It's always a pleasure being on here. You know, when, when you share the same passions with people, it makes life a lot easier. And, and you kind of talk to you, you put those passions right up there along with everybody else. And you're real. You keep it real. I truly enjoy this podcast and, and speaking with you. Well, thanks for that, Art. And we're going to talk about really the passion that Art and his wife, Michelle, started on the season about because it's educating people. It's educating hunters. It's doing things for people that have disabilities. And so you kind of roll it all into one and their life just runs on that passion. So Art, let's just talk about Own the Season and how you educate people through that program. You know, it started for us, Bruce, my wife and I, years and years ago, we started the Learn to Hunt program for our Southwest Wisconsin Longbeards NWTF chapter, which I happen to be president of. And when we started that 18 years ago, I had a game warden approach me and asked about the Learn to Hunt program, if we'd be interested in becoming mentors and starting a program here. We did. And the first year, you know, watching the excitement of the youth and, you know, the people around us that weren't even youth, just new hunters really got me excited in different things. And then I had a lady reach out to me and talked about some disabled hunters and special needs hunters. I said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, help them out and take them, whether they were hunters with cancer, cancer survivors, paraplegics, quadriplegics. It, it didn't matter. We wanted to help. If they wanted to be outdoors, we wanted to help. So we touched base with her, we got things started, and it's just kind of roller coastered from there. And we have taken numerous hunters out. This year we had a young gentleman on a turkey hunt that was in a farm accident two years ago. At nine years old, he was in a farm accident, got caught in a PTO shaft. Pretty beat up. He's recovering now. But, you know, he wanted to hunt, and because we've done it so much now that we know how to get there, and there's so many generous people out there and and people that are so outgoing that, oh, if you're going to do this, you need access to my property because it's easy access where we can get a vehicle to a tree stand or an ATV or UTV or something to be able to hunt and let them enjoy it. And I really had a couple of years ago, we were taking a young female hunter, my wife and I were on a bear hunt and we had just always done it. It didn't really resonate with me that we were doing anything that much different. And we were sitting there one night at supper talking to her and her family and her mom says, you don't understand what this means to her. And I said, well, I think I do. And she said, I don't really think you do understand this. What do you mean? I said, explain this to me, please. She said, there are so many people, relatives and relatives that make promises, friends that make promises until they find out how much work and how much dedication it is 
to take somebody in a wheelchair or to take uh, in a track chair, getting them to a stand or building special stands for them or getting roads so you can get them in if they can't, you know, walk properly, different things. She says, so they all make these promises and then they break her heart. She says, family member after family member, friend after friend, we're going to take her hunting this year. We're going to take her. She gets all excited and then all of a sudden they just say, no, we're not going to do it. She said, we didn't really have our hopes up that high even for this bear hunt because we're like, eh, when they meet her and see how much extra she needs, they're going to go, eh, we can't do that. And she says, but yet here we are. We're in bear camp and you're doing it. I said, that's because we've done it so long. We've figured out what the needs are for people. And that really runs deep because they're no different than you and me, Bruce. They want to hunt. They just have a disability to get from point A to point B. Once they get to point B, they can hunt. It's just that how to get from point A to point B. Once you set it up, once you do it, it's pretty easy to get from point A to point B. And that all comes back to the education part and you know our passion to educate people educate people through the TV show, which is on the season on MOTV. And we try to educate them on how to get these hunters to certain places. If it's not youth hunters, hunters that have, are brand new, if they're elderly hunters that are just now starting. We've had hunters in the program. We had a 78-year-old gentleman who'd never hunted in his life, wanted to start because his grandson wanted to start. And nobody in the family hunted. So they both wanted to be part of it so they could hunt together. So it was all about educating them. So through the show, we try to do that and say, all right, we're going to educate by starting the show out on this is why we are here. This is why we have chosen this spot and what we're doing, how we got this person here, whether it's ourselves whether it's a team member that doesn't have a disability or somebody with a disability, then why we set up the way we did. If the hunt comes together, then we explain why it came together. If it doesn't, then why it didn't come together. And so we're trying to tie all that in to one thing in that show to help these people be successful on their own. But if they want to get that next hunter out there, that youth or that disabled how to get them out and enjoy the woods and enjoy nature like the rest of us do. Want to become a smarter deer hunter? Know when to hunt, where to hunt, how to hunt? Well, Deer Hunting Institute Part 1 was created to do exactly that because many people have told me they struggle with spending all days in the woods and never seeing a deer, only shooting does and young deer leaving the woods empty-handed way too many times. Found Mr. Wonderful, but just couldn't get on him. Having difficult finding a place to hunt. Recognizing possible mistakes you're making every year. Having tried and failed to find qualified mentors who deliver results. If you had these frustrations or struggles, go to deerhuntinginstitute.com and there you'll find a 13-module course to help you solve these problems. Again, go to DeerHoneyInstitute.com and find some answers. You know, when you say that, I'm just thinking of the couple people that I've seen that it still can maneuver, but then you get some people that they're in chairs and you have to build ramps and all that. And I've seen some of your pictures where that's exactly what you've done. And the thing I like best about you and Michelle is you got to figure it out and then you just make it happen. That's great. You have to, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way, you know, back in last October, I had a fall and I broke my back in seven places. I am, if you want to call fortunate, some people say, I don't know if I'd call that fortunate, <laughs> back in some place. but you know, so I fractured my back in seven places. I cracked my sternum, had some other issues with it. 
but my first concern was getting my, who is a very good friend of mine now, who is a paraplegic, out to hunt. How were we going to get him to hunt? And so once I finally had clearance to drive, I could drive him to his stand because I had built ramps prior. All the blinds, all my stands, everything that I have set up for them have wheelchair accessible ramps, wheelchair accessible doors. Everything is accessible to him and the others that hunt with us. So I could get him there with the help of my wife and her getting him the wheelchair and get him in so he could still hunt. Even if I was unable to, there was a will, there was a way to get him into the woods and we did it. And that's what you have to do is, is figure out how to make that work. And if you truly want to make it work, you're going to make it work. Agreed on that. And just a, a footnote, listeners, I don't care what state you're in. Just about every single state has handicap permits that you can get or you can get for friend, family, relatives that you can shoot um, literally out of your truck. You just have to apply with the doctors and, and all that. But that makes it a lot simpler uh, to do. Is it the best way? No, but unfortunately, you know, I've had some situations that I do have a permit and it expires, I think, next year. But I've used that and shot deer right from my truck and then had just call my buddies and they came with the ATV and picked them up and we got them back to camp and took care of them. But what I'm saying is, and I just want to echo what Art said, is if you really want it bad enough, there's a way. The most important thing is to find people like Art and Michelle that will make it happen. And I would just, as a caveat to everybody, do not, never, ever, ever say, oh, yeah, we'll do this. Yeah, we'll put it together. Yeah, we can do this if you're not going to do it. Don't do it to that person because you heard what Art said, his little story at the beginning of this section of Whitetail Rendezvous is so many people say, yeah, we'll do it, and then they get knee deep in it and go, oh, my goodness. It's because it takes a lot of work. I'm not going to lie to anybody or sugarcoat it. It, depending on the disability, there's a lot of time and a lot of effort put into it. Uh, but it's just like that with big deer. <laughs> you know, if you really like big deer, it's a lot of time and effort to try to grow big deer. It's a lot of finances to put food plots in for taxes on your property, water holes, everything else. It's time and money and effort. And it's not as much money getting these people out there. It's just the time and effort. If you really want to do it, it's there. I suggest, you know, to anybody that if we can help, we need to help. You know, the numbers, I just did a Facebook post looking at the numbers and the decline in hunter numbers and the decline in license sales is just astronomical and unbelievable what is happening out there and how quick our numbers are dissipating. And if we don't do something here soon to get more people involved, and to help support organizations like NWTF or Whitetails Unlimited, different Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, all these different things, and buy licenses because the Preston Pitton Fund comes from the license sales to go back into all these animals, all these different things, to habitat. It's, so does the money going to these organizations. If we're not supporting them for not doing this, Pretty soon, we're not going to have anything to support because if we get selfish and say, you know what, this is, it's, it's all about me, pretty soon there is no me anymore. Hunting is, yes, it's individual, but it's a whole team aspect. It's a team that helps, you know, my land management business. Yeah, I mean, and that's it. There, we're losing the opportunities, we're losing hunters. We're losing a lot of people, so it's. I think this is kind of where I was, was hunting is more of a team sport than what you think it is. Yes, you're sitting in a tree by yourself, unless you've got a camera person. Yes, it's all about 
certain things we're looking for as an individual hunter, but it's also we as a team pay to the NWTF, pay to it because it becomes a group and that group becomes the team and that team is what supports everything. It's just like when you hunt on a piece of property, usually you have your dad, your wife, your kids, somebody, and it's a team. Sure, there's only one person pulling the trigger on either a release or your rifle or whatever, but if you all look at it together, you all plant food plots together, you all look at trail cameras together, you all look at – so we all need to come together to make this sport grow and continue to grow and quit being a me and try to help everybody and try to educate people and not let them get frustrated. Let them become better hunters. They're not shooting our deer. We don't own the deer. Jumps the fence, it's whoever's deer. We unfortunately have a lot of people have come to that and said, oh, that's my deer. I can't believe he shot my deer. Eh, It really wasn't your deer in the first place. But if you've got everybody together, then they get excited for it because you've all worked so hard to have those deer on your property or where you hunt that, it, again, it's more of a team atmosphere. And that's what's going to grow this and bring those numbers back to what we need to continue, you know, to be able to hunt in the future. And that's what really a big part of today's show is going to be talking about exactly this thing hunting and i want to just segue into how own the season helps educate people on these things hunting on public land private land improving habitat and then probably the most important in my mind and i know it's in yours youth and women into the sport so let's just take it one step at a time let's talk about you know the importance of educating people how to hunt how to find where to put the tree stands up on public land well i mean there's a lot of different options out there right now you know myself i go in and i help people as a land management specialist on a lot of private land that carries over a lot of the same stuff i i do if i'm on public land the same things i look for you know when i first start i'm going to take a program you know onyx x i'm going to take that and I'm going to take my onyx and take my X, marks the spot, look at that and say, okay, here's my public land. I'm going to take that app. I'm going to look at here is the spots that I want to look at first. What am I looking for? I'm looking for transitions. I'm looking for funnels. I'm looking for fields. And when you look at that, you can overlap the satellite and a topo map. So you can see both at the same time. And if you don't know, understand topo maps, you need to start looking and learning because the closer the bars are together, the steeper it is. The farther apart they are, your grade is very small. Then you've got to look at, okay, where does it come together? Why is it really steep? Does it go down into a big valley where there's a creek? Or how are those animals getting from point A to point B? Where is that transition line looking on those maps? And that's where you truly want to start. It's it's just like on your own property, if you just bought a property. Public land is no different. Where are those transition lines? What am I looking for on there? Where are the elevation changes? Where is the water? Is there any food close? Things like that. Then you look at what time of year am I going to hunt them? Am I going to hunt early season? Am I going to hunt during the rut? Is it late season? Then you've got to look for, once you get into there, what type of food source is it? Are there acorns here? Is there egg fields here? What is there for their, you know, what type of browse do they have? Is it early season browse? Is it late season browse? You know, you want to hit those, you know, funnels and transition areas come rut. Before that, You know, they truly, they're looking for food and water. So find those maps, that mapping system, get your Onyx X, is what I personally use, and I will take that, again, look for those transitions, and then I can go right into that 
and I can actually mark my spot so I know right where to come back to. And that's how I'm going to start when I'm looking for an area that's new to me to hunt. And folks, just get on YouTube and get into topographical maps. Art's the second person in two days. Michael Folks from Folks Outdoors, who writes for Sportsman Nation, talks directly to how he starts. He parallels exactly what Art is saying, that if you haven't looked at topographical maps, topo maps, before you hunt an area, then you really handicapped yourself. Yeah, big time. You need to learn how to look at them and read them. And as he said, you know, go in and, and Google that, and Google topographical maps and learn. You know, the, there's a lot of things on how to read those, how to know where your transitions are, where your steep banks are, where the slight slopes are, creek bottoms, ponds. There's, you can learn all that stuff just by looking at one map. And it's going to cut your time in over half of on-foot scouting because you can truly go in there and say, all right, I know deer won't be here because there's no possible way that they can get here unless they were a mountain goat. It's going to cut that time in half and help you get started. I would add, if you're ever going to hunt out west and hunt elk, you have to know. It's imperative. You've got to know saddles and you got to know benches yes. and springs. I would say those three things, the first all, are the saddles because that's a transition place. I can guarantee you, I can look at a map and tell you that they're going to be either elk, deer, sheep, bear. It doesn't matter. Everything uses a saddle in the mountains. And then benches, north facing benches are perfect places for elk bedding areas. You just have to sort it out. But you have to know how to read topographic maps if you're going to hunt out west. Now, people get a lot smarter with Whitetails is saying, hmm, I'm hunting public land. I'm going to find a place away from the parking areas, away from everything that have specific things and note it. And basically what Michael said yesterday was he's looking for ridge lines that end in a point. He said, I, I can just about guarantee you that on a ridge line ends in a point that you will find a deer bed if there's deer in that area, period. And he's been doing it for a long time. He's, you know, a student of Dan Infelt. Dan certainly has it down about finding bed areas. But it's that easy. It's not hard. But you just have to put in time. Like Art said, it takes work. Art, what about private land? Hunting private land, how does Own the Season approach that? Well, private land is, you know, that's a little bit different, especially in my land management business because, if you own your own land, you can change a lot of things. You can actually change the way deer travel, where deer bed, where deer are drinking. If you don't have water sources, you can create them. You can create bedding areas by TSI work. You can change how they travel by doing certain hinge cuts and certain ways of blocking different things off. So there's there's a lot of things when you have your own piece of property that you can do to make it that much better because you can control how to get from point A to point B without being detected. You can control, you know, hopefully which way that deer is going to move. Granted, when you say it's going to move this way, he moves the other way and makes you look like an idiot. So you can't do it 100% of the time, but deer are like people. People will take the lazy way to walk from point A to point B if they can. The same with a deer, the same with any animal. However, if they need to go from point A to point B through a thicket and they're getting pushed, and because they're survivors, that's you know what they're looking for and what they want to do. So on a piece of private land, and we talk about that through the land management stuff is – how to create those areas, how to create that habitat so you can better hunt it and not educate everything that's on that piece of property. Now, how big of properties do you engage clients for your land management? I've done them as small as 13 acres all the way up to 400. I think the largest one I did was 460 or 465. You know, I can do them bigger than that. It just... 
obviously takes a few more days to get it done. However, there's not a lot of landowners in the Midwest. There's a few, but not a lot that have more than 400 acres that they own in one contiguous piece. Now, if somebody wants to touch base with you about anything we're talking about today, how's the best way to get for them to get a hold of your art? Uh, they could email me at art at arthelenoutdoors.com. So it's A-R-T-H-E-L-I-N outdoors.com. Or they could even go to the website, which is Art Helen Outdoors. And uh, there's a form on there that they can fill out to contact me. And are you on social media? I am. I'm also uh, Facebook and Instagram, and both of those are the same, uh, Art Helen Outdoors. Thanks for that. Let's talk about your passion, yours and Michelle's passion for youth and uh, women hunters. Women hunters, if you look at it, is the only group of hunters that has grown within the last 15 years. Women hunters have actually grown from 2011 is when they really started growing. I believe it was right in 2009 to 2011. To today, they have grown by 85%. So their numbers are huge. And they're a big part of what we do now. And if you haven't shared that time with your wife or a girlfriend or whoever in the woods uh, hunting, there's something special about it. And it's fun watching them learn and watching them. And I'm going to tell you, there's some women hunters out there that I know personally, I've been in this industry for 25 years and I've met a ton of them doing seminars all over that are absolutely incredible. I mean, they go out, they can set their own stands, they sight in their rifles, they sight in their bows, shoot, set their bows up, you name it. You know, I've seen them out there on the tractors putting in their own food plots and stuff. There are some women out there that can definitely hold their own and then some comparative to some of the guys that I know out there. It's fun to watch that. It's, it's just like the youth because for so many years the women weren't out there and, and we didn't see this. And now the youth, it's so much fun, especially, you know, the youth I know as nephews, friends that are around here that I get to watch grow up around this. There's something special from watching them not know anything about a gun, about a bow, about hunting in general, to watching them learn gun safety, bow safety, then actually get out and start hunting and watch their excitement, watch their joy grow. And there's something about that getting up in the morning and watching the sun come up or watching it go down in the evening. And to me, that compared to sitting there staring at a cell phone or playing an Xbox is truly what life is, is looking at God's creation out there and going, wow, this is amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see things come to life. And to watch that youth, it makes me go way back to my first days of hunting. And that's why I truly love watching the youth hunt is the excitement. Don't get me wrong. I still get excited, but I don't get excited like that first time hunter, like that even their second time or third time out there and, and watching their excitement and watching them grow and learn and then watching them start to teach as they grow and watch them start to teach that next generation. And that's why I really, really enjoy, and my wife too, taking women and taking youth, they really try to suck every ounce of knowledge out of you that they can. They have a million questions and they want to learn. And that passion that they have, they want to pass on. It's not like somebody who's, I guess I don't mean this, and I don't mean this in a bad way at all, but it's not like somebody who's hunted for 30 years and they want to pass it on, but they don't want to pass it on because they're getting burned out. If you understand what I'm trying to say, they're just kind of burned out and just kind of doing what they're doing and they help, but they don't have that passion like 
the youth or the female hunters because they're so new to this. And to watch them grab a hold of somebody else three, four years down the road is truly amazing and watch them pass on the knowledge. And I think that's another way that we're going to, this industry and this, our passion for hunting is going to survive is by really supporting that youth and supporting the females within the hunting community. And don't say, eh, she's a girl, she can't hunt. I got news for you. There's some girls out there that I wouldn't want them shooting at me. I can tell you that. <laughs> and my wife's one of them. <laughs> so. Do you want to become a smarter white deal hunter, knowing when to hunt, where to hunt, how to hunt? Over the past four years, people have asked me, Hey, I'm struggling with spending all day in the woods and never seeing a deer. Only getting opportunities at doe or young bucks. Leaving the woods empty-handed too many seasons. Located the deer of a lifetime, but just flat out missed. Having difficulties finding a place to hunt? Recognizing mistakes that you're making over and over again, and you want to eliminate them. Having tried and failed to find qualified mentors? Well, you've come to the right place. Why? Because Deer Hunting Institute Part 1 was created by me, Bruce Hutchin. It's a 13-module course that'll talk about being lost in the deer hunting forest, never edited, hunted. What is a hunter? What is an adult onset hunter? What rules apply? Finding a mentor, choosing a weapon, finding a place to hunt, scouting a hunt location, stand sites, stand access and exit, reading sign, and when to hunt. All these are available for you at DeerHuntingInstitute.com. Go now to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and sign up for the best deer hunting course in America. You know, just to encapsulate what you just said, it's up to every single one of us, men, women, and to set an example and celebrate the hunt, no matter what that new hunter gets. I don't care if it's a doe, it's a spike buck, if that's legal, whatever it is, you celebrate the hunt. And, you know, one of my angsts in social media is, is some of the guys just go, oh, well, why'd you shoot that deer? And that's wrong, folks. I'll just flat say, stop doing that because yeah. that is not helping the hunting industry because we're all hunters. We all bought a, a tag, a license. And so whoever buys a tag, a license, let them go and enjoy however they do it, be it with a spear or be it with a 357 pistol, bow, crossbow, muzzle loader, shotgun, rifle. I think I get it all. Nice. And if it's legal, I, I'm right there with you, Bruce. If it's legal, hey, I, I'm not going to fight it. You know, everybody's fighting. Don't do this. Don't do that. I don't want to be negative or sound negative and say, hey, guys, don't do this. Don't. Let's try to, everybody, you know, as, be as positive as we can be, especially as role models like myself, you, you know, anybody who has the platform in the hunting industry, we all need to be the best role models we can by getting the education out there to educate the youth, the women, the hunting public in general and say, hey, you know what, just like you said before, don't knock them. We don't know their story. You know, that person may have cancer. It may be their first deer. It may be the last deer they ever shoot. It might be, you know, the biggest. Who knows? We don't know their story. So let's try to be supportive of it. Um, we need to quit being, you know, so sexist. And myself with the TV show, I get email after email about things <laughs> It's really even tough to say that the stuff that people say they want to do to my wife, to team members, to our female team members, to the, I don't want to hear that stuff. We're supposed to all be hunters and be a group together. So, you know what? That's my wife. You don't talk like that about people's wives. You don't talk like that about, you know, team members or females in general or youth or anybody else. My mom always said, if you don't have anything nice to say about somebody, just don't say it. So let's try, you know, and I'm asking, let's just try to bring out the positives. Let's, 
hey, you know, that's a great deer. That's a this or, you know, great fish, great bear, different things. And if we don't have to, just don't say anything. If, if you don't agree with what they did, then we don't agree with it. That's what makes the world go round. Because if everybody agreed with everything, the world, you know, would probably stand still because nothing would ever get done. So that's what makes it go round is people have disagreements. So if you want to voice that opinion, it's your opinion. I can't stop you. But try to be a little nicer, per se, when it comes to certain things that you're talking about. Look at it from your own point of view and say, hey, if I got cancer tomorrow, do I want somebody, if that's the last deer, do I want them trashing me? Or if that was my wife, do I really want to say that about that lady? Do I want to say that about that youth? Do one to others as you want done to you. That's just the best way to say it. Why do the anti-hunters even really need to do anything when ourselves were tearing ourselves apart as a hunting community by degrading people and getting on people and Again, let's let's put a positive spin on things and let's be positive and, and lift each other up and keep this great sport flourishing and moving forward and back in the right direction so we can enjoy it. Somebody said to me a while back, said, Bruce, if hunting ceases to be fun for me, I'm not going to do it. What we've been talking about here, listeners, is all this angst or whatever you want to call it doesn't encourage fun. And Hunting should be fun. The outdoors should be fun. Adventures should be fun. Yeah, it's hard work. There's no question about that. You know, you're going to work darn hard at it. But it should be fun, and it should be something that it builds memories, positive memories, for every on a single trip with every single crew and team member. And if it isn't fun, take a look at your attitude. What you're thinking about is hunting a job for me. And if that's how you make your livelihood, I get it because every day at work isn't the best day in the world, but it still has to, at the end, you have to enjoy it and it has to be fun because most of us aren't in the outdoor industry, period. Most of us support us. Is there 11 million, 50 million, like Art said earlier, tag sales, license sales are diminishing, but we've got to make it fun because if we make it fun and we're showing people we're having fun, then other people say, Man, you're having fun. And guess what people want to do in their off time is have fun. Your thoughts out? Right. And that, that's what it's all about. And it's and then it all goes back to again, right where we started this, Bruce, is, is education. You know, it's it's educating people why we hunt. What we do, you know, it's people like, well, you know, hunting is just bad. You're killing animals, you're no, you're you're putting money back into the economy. You're putting money back into forestry work, into, there's so many things, you know, like I said, the Preston Pittman Fund, the, the different things that the money's going to, plus venison is unbelievably healthy for you. So you're also feeding your family with healthy food. There's a ton of different things that this is why we hunt. It's not just to go out and kill something. True hunters I believe aren't out there just because, Oh, I'm going to, there's an animal there. I'm going to shoot it and kill it. No, I'm out there to hunt. I shoot what I need for meat. We eat what we shoot. If I have extra tags that year, I always try to find families that need that meat and we will cut that meat up and donate it to them so that they have that. We're not just out there killing things. We're out there trying to do different things. We're trying to keep an animal population under control. And back to the land management stuff, you look at that. When I go out to farms and I start looking at it, you can automatically tell when there's too many deer out there. There's no browse left. The undergrowth is gone. It's horrible what's happening to the forest. So we need to bring in that forest and get that population under control. That is what we're doing as hunters. We're not out there murdering things and killing things for a throw kill. There's actual reasons we're doing what we're doing. And that's to put money back into things, to keep the forest 
uh, regulated food sources, all kinds of different things. So there's truly a lot of good with it. And that's what we need to do is educate people on why we're doing it. Well said. Let's segue to your team. And I know you built a great team, a diversified team on uh, Own the Season TV. So let's talk about your team members and tell us who they are and where they're from and what they're doing. We've got a pretty diversified team. They're all from here, Southwest Wisconsin area. We have Jesse Lenz, who helps me do some of the editing for the show. We have a husband and wife, Wes and Kayla White. And we also have boyfriend, girlfriend, which would be Tyler Goble and Kayla Cleary. Uh, a couple of friends, that Tyler Ganinen and Brandon Halverson. We're also bringing in Tyler's stepbrother. And, you know, then there's myself and Michelle. It's a very diverse group and from a lot of different ages. You know, we've got another friend of mine who helps us when we need it, Brad Barenbrook. He is more of the gun nut. So when we have gun issues, we have got the guy knows more about guns than I think most gun manufacturers do. He's a freak when it comes to guns. So he's our go-to guy for that. You know, then we have the other group that they really like, you know, one group really likes the turkey hunting. Uh, Another group likes it all, deer and turkey. Wes White, he is him and Rob Drone. Rob Drone is another one on our team. And those two do a lot of whitetails in in Kansas and uh, back here in Wisconsin. So it's diverse in what they do you know they love to ice fish they love to fish for smallmouth bass on the river bird hunting you know jesse lens owns a couple of dogs he loves to pheasant hunt in the fall so it is that diversity and i like that diversity because hunting is not just whitetails hunting is not just turkey hunting yes those are two of the biggest sports and the biggest numbers of hunters out there in those two. But there's so much more. There's pheasants, there's doves, there's, you know, you've got elk and sheep and moose, and there's so many different things. Mountain lions, talk about the biggest post that went crazy on me was my mountain lion. And I'll tell you what, if you've never eaten mountain lion, I know some of you out there are probably going to listen to this, you'll bleh right away. But I'm going to tell you what, mountain lion backstraps are absolutely incredible. Once you get past the the mental thought of, I'm eating a cat, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the backstraps are actually very, very good in a mountain lion. So you put that to good use, like I said, but it's, it's the diversity of the team and, and the group and the ages. You know, they range anywhere from, well, Tyler's – little stepbrother and I'm not saying you know his name out there because he's gonna be a sophomore in high school is all so he's still pretty young and I don't need him getting a lot of pressure from anybody right now so you know you look at that's the youngest all the way up to you know my myself and Brad who are you know I'm 49 and Brad's 50 so again it's just because of what they bring to the table as far as not only hunts, but personalities and uh, thought processes, and they all enjoy the youth. All of them are mentors for me. All of them take out youth hunters. They all get involved in special needs hunts. And so it's near and dear and true to my heart what we love to do, and it just seemed like they all had that really, really good fit for the show and to make the show successful. Thanks for sharing that. And how do people find Own the Season? It's on MOTV, which is my outdoor TV. It's a a subscription web-based channel right now. So you can go Google MOTV and either get a subscription. There are some things coming down the pipe that hopefully if you have the outdoor channel and sportsman's channel, you'll be seeing some more things coming down the pipe about MOTV. If you don't, like I said, you can go do that. Also, we do have a YouTube channel that has 
uh, some partial hunts, some of our older hunts, different things that are actually going to be forwarded onto our YouTube channel, which is again, Art Helen Outdoors on the YouTube channel. So you can find some of that on there or again on MOTV and a lot of updates are through our Facebook or Instagram pages. Well, uh, let's just run it up with a kind of a, uh, where is Art and Michelle today? <laughs> and just give a, people, you know, a, a forecast of your upcoming hunting season. Well, today I'm sitting in my house doing a podcast with Mr. Bruce. Uh, <laughs> and, and my wife, her real job, which I don't know how she does it, is she is an RN and uh, works at the local hospital here. And right now we're putting in a lot of time doing that stuff, a lot of editing, a lot of different things. But as far as what's upcoming, season's right around the corner. So it's a lot of food plot stuff right now. I just got done, you know, mowing fields, fertilizing fields, getting things done at the cabin. I actually just put a new 360 hunting blind up for another spot for handicap hunters and, and built another ramp for that here about a week to two weeks ago. This weekend, we're going to head up north, and we're going to do some fishing in northern Wisconsin and try to get a few fish caught on film. And then we're going to head back to, we just got done doing a charter on Lake Michigan and did some salmon fishing and filmed all that. We're going to go back and do some more filming with the same. And then we're going to be getting into first part of September. Uh, Michelle drew a Wisconsin bear tag, which takes about six years plus she was a lucky recipient of that, so she actually starts on the 11th of September this year. Uh, we're going up to our good friends with Art Hyde and NBC Guide Service, and he is another one who, when we don't draw tags, Michelle and I take our bear hunters up there, our special needs and handicapped bear hunters, to Arts. He's gracious enough to help us out with that and run baits and do things for us when we're not there, him and his guide Gibby and, or one of his guides Gibby. So she's going to be hunting up there with him. Then we come back and we start with whitetails here in Wisconsin. Then I go to Banff and Jasper, Canada for some photo work. We're going up there to do some photo work. And then we'll be right back here in Wisconsin for whitetails again, then head to Kansas. We both drew Kansas tag, so her and I'll be whitetail hunting in Kansas. Uh, if I get time, I'll be heading to Illinois to uh, hunt in Illinois for whitetails, and then we'll get back here to Wisconsin for gun season, and then we will take off and head to Wyoming. Michelle has a late season mountain lion tag in December. Whether or not my back will handle that, if my back is not in condition to do that, I will be the wingman and radio guy in the vehicle. So one way or another, if we're going to get her out there and get her on a line, I'm hoping in December. So there's a lot of things coming up, you know, and the team members are going to be traveling. A few of them have tags in Kansas. A few of them will be heading out to South Dakota for antelope. One of them will be heading to Yukon here shortly for, he's got a moose, grizzly bear, and sheep tag. So there's a lot of things going on right now for all in the season, and, and it looks like we're going to have going into year number two, season one is just about done, should be over, uh, I believe, the end of October, and then we'll jump right into season two, and hopefully, you know, 26 more weeks of shows. Hey, thanks for listening to the show tonight. Before we go, can I take a moment and say thank you? Listen, as we started the Whitetail Rendezvous podcast journey, we had no idea what to expect. But after four years, we received a ton of feedback from our over 400,000 listeners and climbing to half a million. Speaking of which, we are now closing in on over 600 featured guests. Thank you. And a quick shout out to all those who have left an iTunes review and your feedback. I get those and really appreciate it. And it's awesome to see what you have to say. And we do read every single one of them. And I just want you to know that I am incredibly grateful for your kind words regarding the show. And all of the ratings and reviews help us attract more listeners. And if you're one of those new listeners, 
welcome. Great to have you. By the way, if you haven't taken the time to rate and review our show and like the Hunting on Private Land strategy on how to get permission to hunt a private property, go to whitetailrendezvous.com as a special gift for just rating and reviewing our show. When you get there, look for the start button to get the details. Listen, I'll share you the top technique from some of the top hunters in the country on how do they get permission to hunt on private land. I'll share with you the exact techniques they use to get permission. As my way of saying thanks for rating and reviewing the show on iTunes. So join us next time. And remember, we're all on this journey together, learning, sharing, and becoming 365 Hunters. People out there always ask me what it takes to get into the outdoor industry, and I give them my two cents, and Art just gave them you 25 years because it didn't happen overnight. And let's just close the show with just some tips if the listeners saying, gee, I want the, that to be me. What are three tips you'd give the listeners? You know, it, it takes a long time. It's, it's hard. I actually got into it by shooting bull. I was, did a lot of IBO tournaments, a lot of the IBO worlds, and myself and a buddy who now actually runs an archery shop in Dodgeville. He's one of the best technical technicians that I know when it comes to bows. And He went that route. I actually went the route of still shooting, but along that line, I got in with a rep company because there's a lot of different staff positions out there. And to work your way up through, you know, you start out at that shop or shooter staff to the next staff level would be, you know, with a rep group. And then you, get into manufacturer stuff and then there's more and finally you can hopefully work your way up to that national level uh, where I happen to be at now and, and get in at that national level and then the, the TV show level. I guess one of the biggest things you know to work your way up is always under promise and over deliver. That's one big thing. Another thing and I worked with this gentleman forever, and most people know him, Ralph Cianciarulo. And the one thing that Ralph had always told me, I was blessed to be on his show for nine years. Uh, my wife and I were there when that show started and continued with them until business took us separate ways, and we still continue to talk very good friends. However, he always told me, and this is tip number two, was – Always let your actions speak louder than words because the companies will pay attention to those actions. If you're telling them constantly what you're doing and how good you are, you have to be able to prove that. Most people can't come up with those numbers. Not saying that everybody, but a lot of times it's hard to replicate those numbers. They are watching those numbers. They already have your numbers. If you don't think they're watching, (laughs) I got news for you. I had one company use a photo of mine about five months ago, I guess it was now, because they have, under theirs, they also have a product which competes with a different company that I'm with. They used a photo of mine and tagged me Art Helen Outdoors instead of Wild Reflections Photo, which is my photography business. On the other end is Wild Reflections Photo. And the company that I'm with, within 24 hours, I had an email and a phone call asking why I was pushing a competing product. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they had seen this post before I had. So they're watching you. They know what you're doing. So just do what you do and don't talk about it. Just let your actions do what they've got to do. Let them speak for you because they know what you're doing already. And the third one, just be a good person. Be a good role model. 
stay clean out there. Don't do anything stupid. It's not worth it. So many people want to be and want to grow so fast in this industry that they try to do things that they shouldn't be doing. You know, they, they get pinched for shooting something illegally or they did something, you know, they just barely crossed the line. Well, it wasn't that bad. Well, it is that bad. You know, people are constantly watching you. And when you are out there in front of the public like that, everybody wants to hang you. There's a lot of jealousy, if you want to call it jealousy. There's whatever. So just stay clean. Be yourself and take it as it comes. Move forward with it and don't try to push it so hard. Because if you come into this industry super fast, you're going to go out super fast. There's a lot of people that are in this industry that have been here forever that started slow and they're still here. You know, you look at Ralph and Vicky, you look at Lee and Tiffany, you look at Jay Gregory, you look at Keith Beam, you look at all these people and they're still here in one way or another. They're still here and they've been here forever and ever and ever. And so just take your time and go with the flow. The best three things as far as advice that I can really give you to hopefully make it succeed or help you succeed, you know, living your dream and, and having this dream become reality because it can become reality, but it takes a lot of time. It doesn't happen overnight. Great stuff, Art. Art. I'm just thinking about my journey and the journey of Whitetail Rendezvous and now Deer Hunting Institute. And, you know, it's a process, folks. And just know that. And, you know, I look at the last four years, um, the 31st, it'll be four solid years we've been rolling this thing. And, you know, I thought it'd be a lot further along. But then I hear what you just said and I go, it's not so bad. <laughs> and that's all I can say. It's just not so bad. And the people I met, in, in the places I've been, in the interviews, I wouldn't have met these people. I, I wouldn't know you really well without this opportunity in this media. So you and Michelle, you're good friends, and I just wish you the best. And can't wait till we talk in, in the wintertime about how 2019 went. Unfortunately, it'll be over before we know it. So. You got that right. <laughs> I mean, I just look at my calendar. I go, I'm already in December, and I haven't yeah. pulled the trigger yet. I mean, yeah. it's, it's nuts. But with that, Art, again, thank you so much for being such a gracious guest on Whitetail Rendezvous. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate everything you do and the support that you give the hunting community. And again, the way you're helping to grow it, support it, and help educate people to continue this great tradition. So thank you. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.